Well, good morning, 10 o'clock. So glad that you guys are here. If you would stand with us, we're going to start our time in worship together this morning. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame? They were like prisons and we couldn't escape. death and gray well, they were like mountains that stood in our way but he came and he died and he rose those giants are dead now this is our God this is our God this is who he is he loves us this is our God this is what he does Good morning, church. Hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today at Community Life Church on this whatever it is day outside. My name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and it is an honor to welcome you into our family room. And we've got about 100, 150 people logging in online. Can we say good morning to them? Man, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a great service in store for you. Um, one thing, we'll be receiving communion at the end of the service. So if you're logging in online, you want to push pause and go ahead and grab those elements. We encourage you to do that. And then um, also, uh, if you don't know this, we start every service off by praying the Lord's Prayer together. We start a new series today around the Lord's Prayer. So these aren't just words we say. These are words that we pray. And so as we start this service off, I pray that you'll open up your heart and just allow these words to speak to you. So join me, if you will, 
and pray in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. And I thank you for each and every person that, that has connected with us somehow, some way today. Lord, what's going on in our hearts and in our lives. And I just pray that in these moments that we share, God, that we would experience that palpable presence that we only experience from you. And so whether it's in worship or in the message or, or, or in the gathering of, of one another, God, I just pray that we sense your presence in that life-changing, altering way that only you can provide. And so we lean into you today, God, and we ask that you would lead us, guide us, and provide a fresh word for us. We love you, and it is in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Sing this together, church. So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you
are so grateful, Lord. <laughs> Second Corinthians uh, 10, verse 3 and 4, Paul writes this, and I want to read it this morning. It says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. The best way that we can fight physical battles is guess what? what? It's with our spiritual weapons that, that God has given us. We, we fight a lot of battles, don't we? We have the battles that are in our minds. We have our emotions. Sometimes they're physical battles and, and struggles and challenges with family and all sorts of things that make it so difficult. But we will lose every time when we try to fight those battles ourselves. But when we can go to God in prayer and get down on our knees and use the weapons that he's given us, the tools, prayer, and the word of God, then God goes and he fights the battle and he always wins the battle. Amen. We're so thankful um, that you're here this morning. We want you to just have a time where you can just let it all fade away, whatever is going on in, in your life. I know that the troubles will still be there, but can we just take this next uh, moment and just give it to God, whatever it is, just cast all your cares on him. He cares so much about you this morning. And let's just sing and truly worship him from our heart today. Speak to me. You're the only voice I want to hear. Walk with me, walk with me, show me who you are as I draw near. If you're not in it, and I don't want it, let all else fade away.
We need you in our decision making. Um, God, we just focus on you right now and turn our attention completely to you. Thank you for your presence that's here. I'm so sweetly. Sometimes we run around in life and we just try to force all sorts of things to happen when really we just need to take a moment to breathe and just to call on the name of Jesus and let you do the work. And so that's what we do right now. And we just thank you that we know you are moving in our hearts. And we just open up to receive whatever it is today that you have for us. Um, do a work in this place as, as Kat comes to d deliver the word this morning. Um, God, just light her on fire, um, Jesus, and, and help us to have our hearts open and ready for what you want us to receive today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Before you're seated, please turn around, find someone, and let's give them a big CLC welcome. Try to find somebody maybe you haven't said hello to before. And if you're watching online, we'll be right back. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today at Community Life Church. My name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life. And it is an honor to have you in the family room, to have you joining us online. Uh, it, really, it means the world to us that you would find time to be here fighting the elements, fighting all the different stuff. And, and so thank you for, for joining us. At Community Life, we love God, we love our neighbor, and we believe that our mission is to connect people to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the source of life. And um, as you walk through this crazy journey of life, I pray that um, if there's anything that we can do uh, to help you know Jesus, to share Jesus, um, we'd love to be able to stand alongside you in that journey. One of the cool things that happened last week, so if you were here last week, uh, you know that that was when we talked about some of the finance stuff that we had from last year and celebrations and all that, and then what we were looking at this year. Last week, we had three people walk the aisle to accept Christ into their life. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So um, our church administrator said, if that's what happens when you talk about money, we should talk about money all the time. No, that's not, not going to happen. Um, so a couple quick announcements, and then we're going to start our new series today. So uh, this week is Night to Shine. Um, it's going to be on Friday night. It's going to be absolutely amazing. But here's an announcement you need to know, because some people get excited. You weren't able to volunteer, and, but you have that time free. 
do not show up here if you don't have like a responsibility, you haven't been checked in. So because um, Night to Shine is an at-risk community, everyone that is working that night is background checked. So if you just show up rando, we will, tech, we will tase you. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that. So be, be careful. <laughs> Security will deal with you. Uh, so here's what we've done instead. Um, we want you to enjoy the night, and so we live stream the red carpet. There's not a person out there calling the shots, but um, you'll get to see the red carpet. And if you just get a little bit of time between 6 and 7, I think it usually will start going off about 6.30. Just log in and watch it, man. It will do something so powerful to your heart, and so we invite you to do that. We have one other thing that we'd still need some folks, military personnel, that you still have your dress blues, retired or active, and you want to come hes- escort people down the red carpet, we'd invite you to do that. I need you to stop out at the front desk and, and check, and, and we'll get you all signed up. And then one more announcement. So Ash Wednesday service this year is on Valentine's Day. It's on February 14th. What an interesting way to spend Valentine's Day at an Ash Wednesday service. Now, For many of you, if you've started on this journey with us in the last year, you're thinking, this is a non-denominational church. What are we doing talking about Ash Wednesday? That's kind of odd. Here's what I want you to know is that as a church, we have our roots, um, and, and our roots go back to some deep traditions. But here's the promise I will make to you. We will never do something merely out of tradition without explaining it. And Ash Wednesday has an amazing connection back to the faith, and it is the beginning of the Lenten season, which is really the season where we prepare our hearts for Easter. And so we invite everybody to come to the Ash Wednesday service. If you are opposed to having the ashes imposed upon your forehead, you do not have to have that happen. This is the pastor promising you that you do not have to have that happen. But I invite you to come because it's a great way as a church to start in preparing our hearts for what God is going to do through that series and through that season. And so we invite you to come on that night. It's going to be at six o'clock right here in the family room. And I'm just really looking forward to it. So today we start a new series, and the name of this series is When You Pray, and it is a two-part series that leads us into our Easter series, which is called Forever Changed. And so because this is a year of transformation, we were intentional about planning sermon series that help us to engage in our faith. And so two weeks where we're going to talk about prayer, and we've been intentional about who the communicators are because of how they'll relate to you. So we, and we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer, and there's two aspects to it. There's the personal nature. And then there's the corporate nature. And so today, Kat Siler is going to be tackling that, um, that personal nature. She's our discipleship director. She's the, uh, the adult ministries coordinator. Not coordinator, you're the director. You're the boss. Okay. Um, and so she's going to be tackling that personal aspect because she's in charge of disciplines and in charge of discipleship. So she has just a unique understanding of that. And next week, Pastor Addie, she's the cares pastor, is going to be looking at the corporate understanding of prayer. But we're going to be tackling the Lord's Prayer. I'm telling you, it's amazing. The first service, Kat knocked it out of the park, and I look forward to you guys getting to hear her right now. So y'all give her a big round of applause as she comes up. Good. Good morning. How's everybody doing? We awake? Yeah? Getting there? Okay. So I, um, I've been looking forward to uh, tackling this sermon series And it's funny because at the beginning of my week, I had a plan. And my plan was that this week was going to be one of the best weeks of my prayer life. And I was going to be intentional about taking time. I was going to be peaceful. I was going to dive into the word every single day. And it was going to be awesome. I was going to be like this with God. So you know what happens when you make a plan? (laughs) Well, how my week actually turned out was quite different. And just to give you a little snippet of what my week looked like between myself, my family, uh, some of my coworkers and friends, There was a diagnosis of pink eye, a twisted ankle, uh, sinus infections, trips to the doctor. There was cars that decided to just randomly not start. There was tires that blew. There was meetings that were missed. And you know, as my week progressed, my plan didn't go the way I wanted to. And if I'm completely honest with you, I was not like this with God. In fact, it was more like this. And I think it's important to share that with you because 
often in our journey, in our faith walk, I think we get this idea that we have to have it all together. We've got to have our ducks all in a row because we've got Jesus and so everything is up and to the right. I wish that was the case. But I think it's so important that we're authentic with each other and that we're honest with each other where we're at. And so that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. I just wanted to share that with you. And it's honestly given me a unique understanding of this scripture this week. And I'm I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. So as we start this series on prayer, we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer, the very prayer that Jesus himself taught his disciples. We're going to be looking in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 11. And uh, just a couple quick notes about Luke that I think are, are good to know. So this was written about 50 years or so after the time of Jesus's ministry. And so the, the audience Luke is writing to, uh, Luke was believed to be a, be a doctor, be somebody of, of higher education. And so he had a unique ability to speak to certain individuals that maybe others didn't necessarily have the credibility to. But I love Luke's gospel because he gets into these details that are so beautiful. The Lord's Prayer is something that many of you may know. Many of you may not. In fact, some of you may not even realize that the Lord's Prayer is actually in the Bible. (laughs) And that's okay. That's okay. But it is, and it's this beautiful moment in Jesus' ministry. And we're, where we find ourselves is about halfway through Jesus' ministry. At this point, he's collected his disciples up. He's started to teach them. And he is at this point in his journey where he has turned his face towards Jerusalem. And he is starting to make his way to what would ultimately be the cross. And so I think this is so timely that we're talking about prayer and we're talking about the Lord's Prayer right on the horizon of Easter. And so I hope that this speaks to your heart and it gives you some some tools as we work our way towards Easter. So let's jump in. Luke chapter 11, verses 1. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. A few things to note here. In the Jewish tradition, it was not all that uncommon. In fact, this was was common practice for disciples to learn from their rabbis how to pray. And one of the beautiful things about this, this exchange was that as the disciples leaned more and more into how their rabbi would teach them, they would start to kind of identify or have that signature in their prayer that people would say, oh, you, you belong to Jesus, or you belong to John the Baptist. And so as we pray, and I think part of the importance of this is the more we can lean into how Jesus taught us to pray, I think the more maybe people will know that we are Christians. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You see, God is already holy. We do not need to make God holy. That's not what what the scripture is telling us to do. What Jesus is asking us to do is to hallow the name of God. Now, we all have priorities in our life. I think we could all agree. We all have these things that we value. For some, it's our families. Some, it's our careers. Some, it's these hobbies. Um, For some, it's politics. You name it. We have these things of value in our lives, right? Well, What we're being asked to do here is to value God's name above everything else. God is not something that's supposed to be put on the shelf with all these other values in our life that are equal to. No, God's name is to be held holy above everything else. So much so that it doesn't even come close in comparison. And I honestly, I I just skipped over probably one of the most important parts is how this prayer starts. 
Father. This is a unique way to start a prayer. After all, Jesus was the Son of God, but he's teaching us to pray, and so we find ourselves being given this beautiful invitation to start to pray and to acknowledge God as Father, that maybe the connection we have with God can be a little bit more Maybe it's more than just this transactional exchange. Maybe there's supposed to be a relationship. Your kingdom come. When Jesus started his ministry, these were some of the first words on his lips, talking about how the kingdom was at hand. Origen, who was an early church theologian, talks about how Jesus is the Atu Basilea, the kingdom in person. And I think Jesus is reminding us of this, but not just that the kingdom is among us, but that we are supposed to, in our prayer life, lean into that kingdom. We're supposed to lean in and allow that to start becoming part of our lives. You see, when Jesus came to our world, he started bringing order into, he started making order out of chaos. And so the more we can bring Jesus into our lives, the more the chaos in our life will start to slow. In verse 3, it goes on to say, give us each day our daily bread. Now, for those who have, who have prayed this prayer um, or who may have just heard this, I think we, we get to this daily bread as like a, God's going to give us what we need to get through the daily grind. The Lord's Prayer has layers and layers of depth and richness. And while on the surface, it may just appear that God is saying, or that we're supposed to pray to God and say, hey, just give us what we need to get through the day. But what this is really saying is so much more. In the Greek, this term for daily bread is only used twice in scripture. And it's found here and in Matthew during the Lord's Prayer. And I'm probably going to say this wrong, so bear with me. But I'm going to give it a go. Epiousios, super substantial, something so much more, but that is essential to our life. What Jesus is telling us here is that in our prayer life, we need that daily dose of God, that daily I am, to come into our lives and start making changes. Give us each day our daily bread. Now you see, we can't go on to verse 4 without verse 3 because verse 3 prepares us for verse 4. Verse 4 then goes on to say, and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. It's easy to forgive somebody for the little things. But think about the last time you had one of those knockout, dragout fights with somebody, and they scarred you so deep that they put a scar on your soul. And you can forgive a lot of people, but it's really hard to forgive that person. What Jesus is saying here is the more we take God in, the more God works in our lives so that we can then go out into the world and do the impossible, forgive the people that we don't have the capacity to forgive. He can work in us in such a beautiful way that we then have that capacity. The prayer concludes with, and do not bring us to a time of trial. You know, I think that one of the biggest barriers to our faith is often ourselves. I think one of the biggest barriers to our faith is ourselves. I think sometimes we get in the way of what God is asking us to do in our lives. Now, Jesus has provided us a beautiful structured prayer that absolutely we can lean into. But I'll tell you, sometimes even that can become a barrier to us. Now, I've prayed the Lord's Prayer since I was probably five years old. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and it was just something that you did, and we did it uh, all the time. And when I started this job, 
Pastor Scott came up to me and he was like, hey, it's your time. You got to start doing welcomes. You got to do the Lord's Prayer. And I was like, oh, I got this thing. I got this. This is good. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, oh, that's a lot of people. <laughs> They're staring at me. And I start going down these rabbit holes of like all the things that could possibly go wrong. And so for those of you who don't know, on that back screen, we have the Lord's Prayer up. So I could just look up at the thing and just pray. But that wasn't good enough. I was like, in my head, that screen was going to go down. This screen was going to go down. Something was going to happen. None of you all were going to pray. And I was going to be the only voice in the room saying the Lord's Prayer. So what I did was I started writing the Lord's Prayer on an index card. And while all you all had your heads bowed, I would stake out that little index card. And with shaky hands, I would pray the Lord's Prayer. It was crazy. It was ridiculous. I knew the Lord's Prayer. I knew that. But I was allowing my anxieties and my fears to get in the way. And I was so focused on making sure that I said every single word exactly right that I was missing out on this communion with God in that moment. And I think maybe for some of us, we have similar experiences. And now maybe it's not necessarily the structure that becomes the barrier. Maybe it's some other things that give us this reason in our heads to say, you know what? I, you know, I don't, I don't think I can do this thing that's called prayer. And while Jesus has given us this beautiful lesson on praying, Luke then goes on to give us two parables to further shape what a prayer life looks like. In verse 5, we go on to learn. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has been locked. And my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. This, this was a curious uh, parable story for, for me to read, and I was like, man, I don't, I'm not fully understanding how this leans into our understanding of prayer. And then I was listening to a, a, a pastor who started kind of working through this, and he, he brought up a few points that I'd like to share with you today. One of which, this parable does a beautiful job of exposing our bias towards God. How often, so in the same vein as what we were just talking about, as far as excuses and things that kind of get in the way, how often do we sit there and we say, you know what? God is a big God. And this God is spinning the universes right now. And he's also holding the very fibers of our DNA together. So this is a pretty incredible God I have a hard time believing that he cares about my needs. But that's a lie. It's a lie because he does care about our needs so much so that he wants to lean in and help us meet those needs. He longs for that relationship where we can come to him. You see, in this in this parable, they, they, in some translations, in my translation, it says, because of his persistence. This isn't the best translation for this. A better way of reading this is shameless audacity. So yes, the neighbor has come banging on the door. It's midnight at that time. I'll give you a little bit of context. People lived in a one-room home. They didn't have the luxury of having the kids run off to their bedrooms and mom and dad got their own space and you had the nice kitchen. It wasn't like that. They were all together. And so when they turned in for the night, they often slept together. They were all in the same space. And so when somebody comes knocking, they just woke up everybody. And I don't know if you've got little kids, but the last thing I want to do is wake my children in the middle of the night. Because the rest of my night ain't going to go well. 
And yet this neighbor comes and he asks. He asks for something that he is in need of and he's not afraid. He is not afraid of what people are going to think. He's not afraid of the shame that may come because he's not necessarily prepared to take this person who's just traveled who knows how long to his home. He comes and he does the ask. And I think that's something that's so important when we are in our faith walk and in our prayer journey that we don't hold back our prayers because God can handle it. God can handle it. We go on into verse 9 with another example. And so I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if a child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead? Or if a child asked for an egg, would give a scorpion? Or if you then, who are evil, talking about all of us and our sinful nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? To ask, to seek, to knock. I think one of the biggest takeaways in this part of Scripture is that God is asking us to take a step. He recognizes that we have needs, but there's something about the relationship that we have with God where we're called to take a step, move in, lean into God, and not be afraid to ask and to do these things. You know, my, my son Noah, he, uh, he is at this point where he's missing two teeth. Came out a little bit early. It has this really cute smile. Um, and earlier in the week, before everything derailed, we were having dinner. And he, we sit down for dinner, and uh, my husband and I will typically say, all right, who wants to, who wants to pray before the meal? And Noah gets really, really, really excited. He's six. He gets really excited. He's like, ooh, me, 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 right? I want to do this. And so we're like, okay, all right, buddy. Like, it's all you. And so he, he starts trying to describe what he wants to pray. He's like, I want to do that prayer about God. You know, where like you hold your hands and everybody prays about God together, saying the same words. And I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? And then it clicked. Two days prior, we had had dinner with some friends, and in their home, they pray the Lord's Prayer before they eat. And it was this beautiful moment where some of this scripture really came alive to me because Noah was bold. He was like, yes, like I want to do this prayer. I don't think he knew maybe 10% of the words, but man, did he try. And man, was he like, he was gung-ho about doing that prayer. And it was this beautiful moment where I realized that a six-year-old visiting a friend's family was moved by a moment that he then internalized and carried into our own home. And he's six. And you know, I can tell you that his prayer was not perfect. There was a lot of things that he did not say. But it was beautiful, and his heart and the orientation of his heart was spot on. You see, at the at the um, in this in this parable is talking about a child, and I think it it almost echoes back to the beginning of the Lord's prayer, where we're called to address God as Father. Because the the what comes after that is our understanding that we are children. And for some of us, that's a hard pill to swallow because we're grown adults. We have our careers. We have our professions. Like, we've got everything figured out, right? Until we don't. <laughs> Until we don't. But it's this humbling moment 
where we can say, yeah, we're children and we're still learning and we're still going through this process where we're, yes, we're trying to lean into God, but we don't necessarily have it all figured out. And that's okay because God is going to meet us there. God is going to meet us there. At the very end um, of this parable, it talks about how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Remember what I was talking about, about that daily bread? That daily dose of God? That daily I am? You see, there's a lot of things in this life that we believe are needs and they're really wants. And then there's these needs that we're too ashamed to say, yes, I need this. But what Jesus is saying, what we're learning through this lesson, is that God has something so much bigger to give us and to offer us. But we have to be willing to take that step and lean in and and, and engage in that relationship with God. So I told you all how my week has gone, not how I had planned. Well, what I also want to share with you is on Friday, when everything came to a head, and we had gotten my son back to school only to get a call that he was sick again. I was on the other side of town with my husband putting out another fire, and we were working through that together. And so my husband and I get in the car, and we're on our way back out here to Gulf Breeze, And I was mad. I was so, I wasn't mad at my son for being sick. I was just mad at the situation. Because this was not the plan that I had wanted. Like I, I, and it was a good plan. It was supposed to be a plan where I was focusing on God. So like, what, what gives? And you know, as I was sitting there, I had my hands like clenched on the steering wheel. Quite honestly, I was mad at God. And I turned the radio on. And how many of you have heard that song from Hillsong United about another in the fire? And that song talks about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being in the fire and how God is present with them. God doesn't take them out of the fire. He's with them in the fire. For a brief moment, I was like, oh, all right, maybe maybe this is God talking to me. And you know what I did? I turned the radio off. (laughs) I turned the radio off because I was that mad. I turned it off. I was like, nope, not today, God. Because my whole week has gone downhill. You're not coming in now trying to save it. And it took me another 24 hours or so to really calm down. My husband helped talk me, you know, talk me down, say, Cat, it's going to be okay. And I realized that my week was actually sprinkled with a lot of blessings. I was just moving too fast to see it. Among those blessings included my seven-year-old randomly coming up to me and saying, hey, Mommy, I know you're working really hard prepping for your sermon. You're going to do a good job. You're going to do a good job. And you know what? I'm pretty sure I just dismissed her. I was like, I got to get back into this, honey. We'll talk later. God is giving us these nudges. He wants to speak with us. John Mark Comer, who is a pastor, um, does a beautiful job of going into the ancient church understanding and pulling out these lessons that we can apply to our lives today. And he looks at prayer in such a beautiful way and breaks it into four big components. We don't have time today to go into those, but one of those components I do want to share with you, and it's the importance of listening to God. You see, we can have this perfect prayer life, but if we don't stop and listen to God, we're going to miss him every time. We are going to miss him every time. I did. So take the time to listen. Now, I know 
what some of you may be thinking. It's easy when the prayers get answered, right? It's easy when we know what's going down and like God's like, yep, you're good, you're good, you're good. But what happens when we get the no? What happens when God says not yet? What happens when everybody around us gets the yes and we're still asking, when is it my turn? And what I want you to know is that it's okay. It's okay to wrestle with God. But what God is calling us to is to orient our hearts towards him. Go back to the Lord's Prayer. Look at how the beginning of that prayer starts. It starts with acknowledging God in all his might and seeing how we fit into his story. And so I hope, it is my prayer for you, that as we go in and we approach the Lent season, as we move towards Easter, just as Christ was moving towards Jerusalem, that we are intentional about orienting our hearts to God. Doing that through our prayer life, it does not have to be perfect. You do not have to have the the structures down on lock. It can be something as simple as sitting there and saying the name of Jesus with tears rolling down your eyes. And he will meet you there. And that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Do not hold back your prayer requests. Do not sit there and say, you know what, God? I I don't think my prayers are worthy enough. He wants us to take every single request, lay it at the foot of the cross, and he wants to meet us there. But we have to take the step. We have to press into God because he's waiting. He is right there waiting to meet us. And we can do that in prayer. And it's my hope and my prayer for you that over the next several weeks that you start to make prayer part of the rhythm of your day-to-day life. And it's okay to have a week that derails and nothing happens the way you wanted it. Because God will meet you there, and you can try again next week. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to get into your word and really unpack the very words that Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago. A prayer that has been prayed over and over and over again for so long. A prayer that connects us to our roots and brings us forward, but a prayer that truly roots our lives in you. Help us to understand how prayer plays a part in our lives and help us to see the fruits of what prayer can do in the transformation journey of our faith. We give up this time to you. We do this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Can you give Kat a big round of applause? It's so interesting, the difference between a first service and a second service. It's a completely different sermon. Um, So I'm just going to stay for the third one, too. Uh, So I'd like to invite our communion stewards to come forward. And as they're getting getting ready, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to let Addie be my hands and feet because I've been battling with a cold and you don't want it. Amen? So I'm going to do that from here. Uh, One of the things that just blows me away about this text that she's reading is the disciples ask Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus says, When you pray, say this. When you pray the Lord's Prayer or when you follow that pattern, it is literally the words that Jesus gives us to pray. Oftentimes in Scripture, somebody asks Jesus a question and what does he give them? A a parable, right? Like a story that you've got to figure out and you've got to just try to figure out what it means. But he gives us those words to pray. This table, not this table, but the understanding of communion, this table, understanding in our lives is one of those truths that Jesus gave us specifically. That time when he was gathered with his disciples in those end moments, like less than 24 hours before he would go to the cross, he does exactly this to call them to remember the life that he lived and the life that he would give for them. And so today as we gather around this table, this is not just something we do. This is something that we participate in to be a part of, to connect to our faith and the lessons that Jesus would teach us. And so, It was on the night that he was betrayed that Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He turned and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
as often as you eat, do so in remembrance of me. And then in the same manner, he took the cup and he, he said, this is my um, blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink, do so in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these very simple elements that mean so much in our lives. God, I know that each and every person that's here and all the people that are watching online, we have things that we're struggling through, we're walking through, just like the week that Kat was describing in her life, but maybe times 10, the things that we're facing that we've heard from doctors or that family members have have had happen to them. But here's the amazing part about it, is that you gave us a way to remember that we were not alone in this world, that there was one who went before us that loved us so much that he was willing to give his life. His body was broken and his blood was shed so that not only naturally could we be healed, but also spiritually we could find healing and and forgiveness for, for our souls. And so today as we gather around this table, Lord, I pray for freedom. I pray for healing. For whatever it is that we're walking through, God, we ask that you would be God in each and every one of those instances. We love you. We trust you. And it is in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, some quick instructions Uh, here at Community Life. We receive communion by intinction. And so as you come forward, if you'll hold out your hand, we'll take a piece of bread, we'll tear it off, we'll place it in your hand, and then you move over to the cup and you dip it in the cup and you can receive it that way. If you're nervous about germs or maybe if you've been sick, um, when you come forward, uh, you can go ahead and take, um, we have individually wrapped communion elements in the baskets. Take one of those. Take a few of those. If you have people at home that weren't able to make it uh, to church today and you can bring communion home to them. Um, On the stage, we have uh, baskets. Whenever we receive communion, we take up a communion offering and this resource is what we use to provide food and clothing for some of the the greatest needs that we have here in the church and in our community. And so thank you for doing that. And then last but not least, if you have a special dietary need, gluten-free allergy, um, Addie will, Pastor Addie will have the the gluten-free alternative down front. Just make your way to the table and she'd be more than happy to serve you. Amen. All right, I invite the first few roads to go ahead and stand. Exit your road to your right and come forward as you're able. Lord, I come and I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Stand, I'll fall on you. 
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. And Jesus, you're my hope and stay. song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. invite you, if you will, to stand with me. You know it's a good Sunday when you're praying to multiply loaves. <laughs> I think we saw a miracle down here today, and somebody's going to Walmart between services to find some of that Jesus bread. 
Um, it's awesome. And thank you all for being such an amazing church and just allowing us to be a part of these moments. God is truly special in the work he does in our lives. Um, one announcement, because it's raining outside, the officers will not stop traffic because of the danger. So if you live towards Navarre, I encourage, if you will, to go right down Soundside Drive and come around and go up Nantahala just to help um, alleviate some of the traffic that's here. Just take your time and relax and all is going to be well. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and thank you for the message today. And God, I pray that, that, that the words that Kat speaks, God, as, as just thinking about the Holy Spirit being given to us, it's the answer to every prayer, regardless of what we're asking, that you will help us to navigate through, to walk through, and to approach every aspect of life because we have the Holy Spirit that discerns and leads and guides. And so as we go out from this place, I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us, that the Holy Spirit will give us words to share, and that the Holy Spirit will allow us to see the things that you've called us to. Keep us safe. Watch over us. We love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.